Thank you very much, uh, Chief Bayo. Uh, I agree with you wholly that we must uh, carry the judiciary with us uh, in various ways uh, so that uh, uh, they can uh, look favorably at our dis awards when, <laughs> when they are taken to the judges. But on a more serious note, I don't envy the judges who sit in enforcement or set aside proceedings uh, in matters arising from some arbitrators. I have seen some arbitrators, some arbitration awards and wondered if I were a judge asked either to set aside or to enforce this award, what would I do? Because you look at some awards and there are some very serious issues arising, some touching on arbitrator integrity, ignorance, and even bordering on incompetence. So what are judges required to do? I'm happy that we have some judges in this conference. Uh, maybe they will tell us uh, how they go about that. Now, my presentation is titled Arbitrator Integrity. Should we work to the same standards as the judges or to different standards. Actually, the first title for this paper was different. My first title was Arbitrators, J. Who knew Guana? <laughs> and I wanted to give local examples and examples from other places of uh, things which arbitrators have done which are really not up to standard. But of course, uh, uh, Professor Wahab has presented that very well, so it's just as well that uh, I changed the title of my paper. So my paper explores integrity issues among arbitrators. <laughs> to establish if concerns about arbitrator integrity are a matter of perception, reality, or simply fiction. Lack of arbitrator integrity <coughs> undermines the reputation of the individual arbitrator concerned, the remainder of the tribunal where you have uh, three members, it undermines the integrity of the appointing authority of the appointing institution or the administering institution the arbitrator accreditation institution and the whole system of the administration of justice. We must bear in mind that corruption against arbitrators is very easy to allege, especially when one has lost in an arbitration. The first thing such a person will say is that this arbitrator was bright or corrupted, that's why I lost. Nobody wants to lose. And so even as we talk about arbitrator integrity, we must bear that some of the some of the complaints are simply motivated by the fact that uh, parties have lost in arbitration. So what is arbitrator integrity? There are several definitions. That is just one of them. Uh, choice of, uh, choice, it's a choice, uncompromising, uh, predictably consistent commitment to honor moral, ethical, spiritual, and artistic values and principles. It's really a choice, and it's a very uncompromising stand which is consistent over a long period of time, not just uh, 
conducting one arbitration with integrity and the next one uh, to a different standard. And then commitment to values and principles. That is one definition of integrity. There are many definitions. Uh, I'll not bother you with them. Let's adopt that one for now. So, in answering whether arbitrators should be held to the same standards as judges, we must bear in mind the uniqueness of arbitration. Because arbitration is very, very unique. One feature is the principle of competence, competence, that an arbitrator has competence to decide on his own jurisdiction. In fact, under the Kenyan legislation, challenges against arbitrator bias must first be heard by the arbitrator. The court comes after that. If a party is not satisfied with the arbitrator's decision, then uh, you know, somebody can go to court. But the arbitrator first determines if he is biased or not. And that, of course, goes against uh, the rules of natural justice, that a man shall not decide his own course. So that rules applies for everybody else apart from the arbitrator. Now, for an arbitrator to decide a matter in his own course fairly, he must be, he or she must be of impeccable integrity. We are seeing that nobody else can decide on his own course apart from an arbitrator. So what are we expecting of an arbitrator? Now, the other feature of arbitration, which we must bear in mind in answering this question, is there no, that there are no precedent, precedents in arbitration. You do not take into account the decisions made by other arbitrators. Uh, and in fact, even authorities of uh, courts may be persuasive but not binding. So the fact that there are no precedents gives the arbitrator a lot of leeway. Now, the third one is confidentiality. Because arbitration is confidential in terms of its process and the outcome, uh, it means that the press and the public are excluded. And you all know that the press and the public are the best safeguards of integrity. They expose people. They expose rot. They expose rot in the government, in the local authorities, in the police force, in the judiciary, everywhere. So we have here a system which excludes the public and it includes the press. Fair enough, people have chosen it knowingly and you know they knew that the process would be confidential and indeed one of the reasons why people choose arbitration is that very aspect, confidentiality that the very existence of the dispute will not be broadcast to the public, that uh, their trade secrets will not be discussed in public, fair enough. But what I'm saying is that that very pillar of arbitration, that very foundation, raises a question of what standard should be applicable in arbitration or when we are considering arbitrators. Fourthly, he is the master of procedure. He determines his own procedure except when the parties have agreed otherwise. Um, the others are straightforward. I will not talk about them because the bell has rung. I have five minutes and I would like to go quickly to something else. And it's Caesar's wife. There was a man, a real man, not, this is not fiction, called Julius Caesar. And he had a wife. You have heard of Julius Caesar's wife. She actually had a name. Uh, she was called uh, Pompeia. And one time there was a feast being held in honor of a god called uh, Bona 
there. That's a Roman God, uh, God of goodness, actually God of fertility and uh, fruitfulness. And uh, there was a feast one evening, and only women were required, were allowed to attend that feast of fertility and goodness. Uh, why men would be excluded from such a feast, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a man called Claudius came up with a very innovative, uh, innovative scheme. Uh, he was actually uh, what a Kenyan judge called recently the male equivalent of a slave queen <laughs> or, or a woman eater. <laughs> Judges like using long words. I would simply have called him a slave king. <laughs> He had even changed his name from a longer version to a sleeker, a shorter version. So his scheme was to attend that feast dressed as a woman. And it worked. And the reason he wanted to attend the feast was because uh, Pompeia, Caesar's wife, would be in attendance. And uh, he wanted to have a private, a very private one with her. So she attended. But somehow, it could, it could be the way he walked or the way he talked, you know, maybe he could just balance his body the way it's supposed to be balanced in such a location. Somebody spotted him and said, hey, what's up? Uh, anyway, when it was discovered what he, has, he had done, he was tried, he was taken to court and he was tried. And at his trial, something interesting happened. The, the prosecution was overconfident. The prosecution was excellent. Uh, Cicero, one of the greatest orators, was one of the prosecutors uh, with others. But they were overconfident, so they didn't prepare themselves well, and they lost. So uh, uh, this character was set free. But then the king, but, but then um, Julius Caesar did something astonishing. He said, or rather he divorced his wife all the same, even though she had been discharged of all uh, charges of mischief. And he said, my wife ought not even to be under suspicion. My wife ought not to be even under suspicion suspicion. Now, I know time is running, so I'll go quickly to my next slide and ask you, what is the applicable standard for judges compared to that of arbitrators? Is it the balance of probability? Which standard applies, for example, when a tribunal is investigating uh, misconduct charges about, uh, about against judges? Uh, probably balance of probability? I don't know. Uh, reasonable doubt? I don't know. You tell me, you are the lawyers. In the case of Julius Caesar, the standard he applied on his wife was any doubt or unreasonable doubt or that she must be above reproach. And I don't know which standard is applicable to arbitrators. I'm going to suggest it's somewhere between the second and the third one. Beyond reasonable doubt, certainly arbitrators, uh, you know, should uh, pass that one at least, reasonable doubt. Uh, but the, one, the third one of Caesar and his wife is probably too onerous, so arbitrators probably some, lie somewhere in between there. Uh, so thank you very much for listening to me, and uh, let us, as arbitrators, endeavor to be above reproach. Thank you very much.